Well, hello everyone. My name is Brian Carey. I'm the VP of Marketing here at Unbound Medicine. And I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, where a small group of experts will discuss pre-brief and preparation activities with NGN integration. We know your time is valuable and we really appreciate you spending it with us. First, let me go over some logistics. Our experts will be answering some questions at the end of the webinar. Please type any questions you have in the Q&A box and we'll answer as many as we can. This webinar is also being recorded and will certainly be shared with everyone that attends the webinar. Lastly, there's gonna be a survey at the end of the webinar and your feedback is very important to us. So if you can, take, just take a couple of moments and, and fill that out and let us know how we did. Now, let me quickly introduce our panelists. Sammy Rahman and Rhonda Lance are both colleagues at the Blinn College of Nursing. They both have extensive nursing experience. Our third presenter is Danica, Danica McCray, and Danica is the Associate Professor and Associate Degree Nursing Clinical Simulation Coordinator at Austin Community College. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Danica. Thanks, Brian. Hi, I'm Danica McCray. Um, before we get started, I'd like to just define what pre-briefing is to make sure we're all on the same page. So according to the healthcare simulation standards of best practice, pre-briefing are preparation activities and briefing activities that are done prior to the start of the sim. So this could include having your students review content such as newborn circulation or rhythm strips um, and or orienting to the gameplay. So in the video you're about to watch, it's a 10 minute video, um, it will depict how student learning is affected without decent debriefing. And then we're gonna demonstrate some of the components that should be addressed in pre-briefing and why. While watching the video, there are some cues or points that we'd like you to take notice of. So first, considering that pre-briefing is such an integral part of setting the student up for the success that in the last review of the healthcare simulation standards of best practice, which was, um, they were reviewed September, 2021, pre-briefing became a standalone standard. Next, that designing the pre-briefing is an essential part of the sim experience. Um, you can help faculty do this by making sure that they're prepared, that they understand the objectives and they've actually played through the simulation game that you're having your students use. Another consideration is effectively communicating with the students, providing them a structured review of the expectations. Let them know the particulars of the simulation. Is it graded, not graded? How do they get credit for their work? Um, maybe it's just upload a completion certificate or bring a copy of their report to their sim day. And how will that debriefing work? Now, if you use a non-interactive sim, such as one from Montgomery College that we use frequently, we let our learners know what we want them to observe while they're watching the sim. Uh, signs and symptoms that the patient may be demonstrating uh, how the nurse communicates with peers or family, safety measures present, uh, take relevant notes on the information from the chart or the shift report. And then lastly, by incorporating the standards of best practice related to pre-briefing, you can help boost your students' confidence in learning. So on with the show, Brian. Wow, well, that was a waste of my time. I have no idea what I was supposed to get for that sim. Yeah, I know. I wish they would have told us it only worked on Chrome. I tried three different browsers to get it to work. Did you guys do anything with the summary report in the end? I took a screenshot just in case we had to prove that we, we did it. Okay, I'll have to do any more of those. I don't know. I had to run. I have. I didn't plan for this to take a full hour, and now I'm going to finish it. Do you guys know if we have to rerun it? I was halfway through before I realized the game came to school, and I swear we haven't had a lecture on Chrome Player yet. So how does it Expect us to know the <laughs> <laughs> Has this ever happened to you? You spend time, effort, maybe even some money getting the ideal virtual sim, one that aligns perfectly with your course content and your student needs, only to hear them complain and seem frustrated after the activity. The good news is it doesn't have to be that way. If you use pre briefing, you can solve all that. Pre-briefing gets the learners' complaints out and helps put their confidence in. Plus, it's compatible with all forms of simulation, not just virtual. 
pre-briefing has learner-centered technology based on adult learning theory. It's designed to boost student learning through its special patented use of orientation and psychological safety. I'll let Sammy and Rhonda tell you more about how pre-briefing can work for you. Sammy, Rhonda. Rhonda. Yes. I am so sorry to disturb you, but do you have a few minutes? I've got a real issue with some students and some complaints about some things that I did with them. Oh, well, certainly take a seat. Okay. I, I thank you so much for your time. I know you are busy and I don't want to disrupt you very much, but um, I've made some notes. And so I'm going to kind of make sure that I cover everything, but would you also mind if I take some notes? Oh, no, certainly. Okay. Because okay. you are so experienced and I want to take take that. I know the students really uh, seem to uh, love the way you do things. And so maybe I'm missing out on some well, details. thank you for saying that. Let's see, what can I help you okay. with? Okay. So um, I had some students and I assigned them a virtual simulation experience, okay. which uh, we thought was wonderful technology. Very excited to um, be a part of this learning platform. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I basically gave them the link and how to get into the system and make sure that they're ready to go. And they were going to be working on it individually, but uh, I had a group of three students that apparently uh, it was a bad experience for them. And I'm, I'm not exactly sure what I did wrong. I thought I prepared the information for them. I, I, I told them where they needed to go and how to do things. Okay, well, that is certainly an important step to give them access to the link and to tell them what, you know, to get them in the right spot. But pre-briefing is more than just that. Pre-briefing, that's a word I'm not familiar with. Oh, pre-briefing. Well, let me tell you the importance of that. Just like back in the day, remember, when we were nurses on the floor? Yes. When did we start planning for discharge? At admission. Just like we did then, we are planning and setting up our debriefing before the simulation starts by doing a pre-briefing. Okay. So and you are probably already doing it without even recognizing it. Tell me some of the class activities you do with your students. Well, we have done a, a number of things, mm -hmm. including in-class um, case studies and some in-class simulations, literal acting opportunities for the students to kind of play the role of a patient. And then this is the new platform that we've introduced over the last few weeks is the virtual simulation experience. And um, I, I think it's a very good experience. I think it's a very uh, good opportunity for them to independently uh, try to think about how to respond in these really pretty interactive simulation experiences. Okay, so see, you already are doing some of the pre-briefing. Are you letting them know ahead of time whether this is a graded assignment? Well, um, I sometimes do. Okay. Um, I'm not sure that I did that this time. Okay. I'm not exactly sure that I'm uh, clear enough on how to count this towards their clinical time. We're still working on that part. Okay. Well, if you think of pre-briefing as setting the ground rules, Kind of like our syllabus is the ground rules for our class. Oh. Pre-briefing kind of sets that up for the students for this simulation, for whatever activity you're having them doing. And it has become so important that the healthcare simulation specialty, oh, what is it? Healthcare simulation standards of best practice um, has made it its own category. Oh, wow. I, I didn't know that. When did that happen? I don't know, but not that long ago. But one of the oh, you know what? They made an announcement last fall. Maybe that's what it was, but I didn't read through all of the changes. Well, sometimes it is easy to get bogged down in some of those emails, but they've even broken it down further into three basic categories of pre-briefing. And you want to try to make sure you touch base on all of them. So are you saying that pre-briefing is really necessary? It is. It's, it's going, it, research oh, has shown okay. that it increases student satisfaction, increases their learning, which is all right we're after is yeah. increased student outcome. Yes. yes okay? okay. We don't want to see these students again next semester. No. I know a few of them I don't want to see. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. So. so one of the things that you can do is have you run through the simulation yourself? Well, a little bit, but not from start to finish. Go ahead and do at least one from every platform where you assign students or every site so that you know exactly what all the steps are and do it from the student view 
you can't just hang out in the instructor side of these websites. Okay, I guess I guess I need to reprioritize my time a little bit better. However, it's going to probably cut down on your complaint, so you may find some time there. Oh, thank you. That's absolutely true. Another thing um, that you can do is once you've done one or two on that website and you've introduced your students to that website and you've really prepared them, if you go back to that website to do a different scenario, your pre-briefing is practically done. You don't have to start from square one. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. So can you expand a little bit more on maybe things I need to do in the process of preparation or briefing, pre-briefing? Yes, one of the things you want to make sure for especially is that you have taught the material that you're expecting them to apply in the simulation oh. before you give them the simulation. Okay. okay. Remember as new nurses where we get thrown into those situations and we have no idea what our role is and how uncomfortable that made us feel? Yes, yes, yes. Our yes. students are in the student role and we need to protect them from that. They need okay. to know that it's safe to make mistakes. So that is it a graded assignment or is it participation? Is it a learning activity oh. or, am I, or am I using this as a benchmark? All right, so I guess I thought that, you know, the effectiveness of the ex simulation experience, whether it's virtual simulation or actual simulation in the uh, uh, virtual platform was all about the de debriefing and that's where all the learning took place. Well, quite a bit of learning does take place in the debriefing, but remember with our pre-briefing, we're setting up for that debriefing because we can even start talking about debriefing before the simulation starts, kind of give them an idea of here are some of the questions I might be asking you. Or we're going to all come together and do the simulation again as a group and let's see if it's any different. We're going to talk about and discuss our answers so students as they go through the experience themselves can make notes that then they can bring to debriefing to encourage the learning of all students. Because you know, you and I can say the same thing over and over again, but they hear it from up here and the light bulb goes on. Okay, so Healthcare standards of best practice. Healthcare simulation standards of best okay, practice. Okay, the healthcare simulation standards of best practice. So that is one area of outlined information which incorporates pre briefing and briefing and then takes you through the real processes of a, of a, of a very effective simulation. What other resources do I need to look at or any articles or anything I can? Why don't you let me send you some of the resources I use? I'll shoot you an email. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, so I need uh, maybe some references and some uh, websites if that's possible. And hopefully I will do a better job and I'll have less students complain. Listen, we're all in this together. We're gonna learn how to work smarter, not harder. Ah, very good. Thank you. I appreciate your time, Rhonda. I, I know you are busy, so thank you. Bye. Have a good day. All right. Bye-bye. Well, Rhonda, I have to tell you, that was so helpful. The students even thanked me for their virtual clinical experience. See, it's all about working smarter, not harder. Yes. It's such a beautiful day. Yay! If you act now, not only will you get pre-briefing, but will include moving to the classroom, which incorporates the use of of free virtual products and next generation NCLEX type items. As a bonus, we'll also send you our proven debriefing kit. All these items are guaranteed to improve student satisfaction and learning outcomes or your money back. Okay, I hope everyone enjoyed that. that uh, brief video. Um, I thought it was very entertaining. Um, if um, now Sammy and Rhonda are going to talk a little bit on how to uh, reflect on the video and how to um, move, um, how to incorporate NGN and clinical judgment into the, um, uh, into pre-briefing. Uh, to get started, um, we can um, chat for a moment 
we really wanted to um, bring across the experience of, 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 of faculty and sometimes the dilemma we get ourselves into, especially when we're trying to be innovative and creative and um, we get excited and, and in that excitement, it takes, uh, it takes a moment or two to kind of reflect and think through uh, the processes and certainly um, our ability to have the resources that we have this day and age um, has been uh, incredible. And over the last couple of years, we've, you know, we've worked really hard to try to bring uh, our, our students to a place, despite the fact that we've had limitations in our clinicals and limitations uh, even meeting together face to face. So go ahead, Rhonda. I think part of the originally when um, we were all shut down with COVID, we all got in so panicky. We were platforms were being developed and we were spending out, you know, sending out things left and right. And we weren't taking the time to make sure that the students knew what the expectations were or what to watch for. And so now that most of us are kind of trying to get back in somewhat of a, of a normal type of schedule that we need to kind of revisit the fact that when we start students on, on a new simulation, it, whether it's virtual or in person, that going ahead and telling them, not telling them what's going to happen to the patient, but giving them suggestions on what they need to be watching for. Um, it's kind of like we do objectives in our classroom so they know what the objective of the lecture is. Having objectives for them to know, this is what my expectation is for you to learn. And you can go ahead and start including the next gen terminology like recognizing cues and analyzing those cues so that they're hearing that in simulation, they're hearing it in lecture and they're seeing it on exams, I think is gonna help set them up for uh, success when the test changes. Yeah, and I, I think we can all agree that clinical judgment is the most important skill nurses um, need to learn. And so we have to interject that with our students and any skill there is a, a no way that we can get to the place that we need to be without practicing it uh, and, and practicing it thoroughly and over and over. So, uh, you know, some of this guided learning experiences and, and, and the preparation, you know, we want them to develop. And so we have to really give them the repetition uh, and the experiences in the lab or in the clinical setting, we have to, you know, guide them through or in the classroom, being creative with our, with our time in the classroom and, and, and the presentation of the materials and how we can use a number of, of avenues of, of learning and teach, teaching and learning. I think one of the things that we, um, you know, want to, you know, encourage all of you, and, and some of you may be, you know, further along in, in this journey because of uh, some of the pressures over the last couple of years, but to, to really think uh, of ways of, you know, preparing the students, it might be that you give them a, a preparation video, a, a, a situation, you know, more, the more details that we give them, and it, like uh, Rhonda shared, it doesn't have to be like exactly what they're going to see or exactly help them expect things too much, but if we don't give enough of the background, then they, they can lose the connectivity with the experience, and they can just see it as another burden of learning. Uh, in their mind, you know, they just, they want to get to the next. And so it's it's our responsibility as educators to, to be creative. And, uh, and it increases student satisfaction so much when they know what the expectations are, when they're not thrown in and going, I, I didn't know what my role was. So things like role assignment, um, whether it's a graded assignment or if it's just for learning, are there other options? Is it, uh, how long is it going to take? Especially if you're having them do something virtual um, and on their own, give them an estimated time. Uh, I, you know, we tell them I'm giving you an hour's worth of credit. So if you're spending three hours on this, you're probably not using your time wisely. But then again, I don't want you to spend three seconds on it either. So kind of give them some guidelines for what to expect and then you can set up your debriefing like we talked about in the video going over case okay, so this is a case of 
we're going to have two cases and they're both going to be admitted with hyperglycemia. So one might be DKA, one might not be, one might be this, one might not be. And so that, that they know what some of the signs and symptoms and things that they're looking for, because they are still learners. They're still new and, and depending on, you know, am I going to do that with my students that are about ready to graduate? Probably not. Am I going to do that with my first or second semester students who are still, you know, the baby nurses that we all love and adore? You know, they might need a little more handholding. And then again, like we said, if we're repeatedly using the same platform, the same uh, EMR, then we can teach them once and then they can take that with them as they use that same program. And definitely, I think one of the things that we tried to emphasize in, in our uh, attempt at uh, the, uh, the faculty dialogue in the midst of this video is how important it is for you as a faculty to experience, whether it's virtual, clinical, or preparation in the simulation lab, did you go through the simulation yourself? Do you know what the steps are and, and where they might run into problems or where they might find challenges? Because it certainly makes the, the following steps of the actual experiences that they're going to do and the debriefing not be so traumatic. We want to emphasize the essence of safe experiences for these students so that when they're done, they, they, they can feel, you know, maybe they made some mistakes, but this is the place to do it. This is, this is causing no harm and we can rethink and we can um, recognize where do we need to work? What steps in our, in our clinical uh, practice do we need to improve? Is it handling the, the IV pump and hanging fluids? Is it actually you know, the documentation uh, aspects of things, all those little pieces that sometimes we find so natural and so easy because we've done it for years. We just step in and we become, you know, the caregiver. Uh, that's just not as easy, uh, especially, you know, varying, varying personalities of our students. So um, that's, that's where we hope um, we're translating um, out to everyone that, uh, this may be a new concept for some of you, and some of you may have been have doing this all all along. Your preparation is excellent, but you can you can also see where there can be pitfalls, and you might have colleagues that you might need to encourage to 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 read this particular part of the standard to to see the the essence of preparation and what it can do from the very beginning of whatever the assignment is going to be, then when the students arrive. Um, to the experience, whether it's a virtual experience or a face-to-face -face experience or something you're doing in the classroom, that it's, they're able to feel uh, the process and feel their way through it instead of just like feeling like they've got blinders on or their eyes are closed or they're being judged at every step. Yeah, there's no crying in simulation. Like, no crying in baseball. There should be no crying in simulation. Are we ready for questions? Well, that was excellent. Thank you for uh, thank you for that discussion, and I hope everyone enjoyed that enjoyed that video. Um, I'll invite Danica back in to uh, to answer some questions that came in from the uh, from the audience. Uh, the The first one would be, you know, is there some guidance for the amount of time dedicated for preparation and pre briefing uh, uh, events? I'll take this one. Um, not really. Uh, th there are some guidelines in for like the length of debriefing and those kinds of things. Not really. And it kind of depends on what you're doing. If you're doing an in-person SIM and you know, like you're giving report on the patient, you know, it may not, may not take as much time if you're having to instruct them or give them a video to watch about a new platform that you're using, it may take a little longer. So there is no set limit. But do keep in mind, like I said, if you go back through the same the same um, product again and use it again and again for different scenarios, they're going to get the hang of it faster and you're not going to have to spend as much time. Does that hopefully answer that question? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Rhonda. Um, the next question um, is, uh, how does the level of the learner affect pre-briefing? So maybe we can ask, um, maybe Sammy can can answer this one um, and then we'll hit Danica with this. There's another question coming in after this. 
Okay, well, I mean, I think we've uh, alluded to that a little bit that when you have um, students in their very first semester of, of uh, nursing school, they're, you know, they're not only personality wise tentative and, and you know, in some kind of a bull in a china shop um, because they're so anxious and so nervous. Every level, depending on how many semesters your programs are, you know, three, four, five, um, fast tracking and different things like that, the experience uh, of the faculty to recognize how much information needs to be, uh, you know, given in detail and that type of detail, that's where you have to recognize the amount of time in preparation and pre-briefing that uh, the, those novice, very first, early first and second semester students, their experiences are different. They're, they've had limited time in the clinical setting. Um, their interaction with patients and conversations with patients and, and understanding, recognizing those cues, they're just in the process of that. Whereas in their third, fourth, uh, fifth semesters, however uh, the programs are designed, They've had more time. They've had more hands-on. So I, I think I think it's a it's somewhat safe to say is you you have to know your learners and know know where they are, and also recognize that some it takes a little longer for them to catch up. And so you there may be a group it, it, within a group that you're you're challenged to try to get them to understand and and how to be prepared. Uh, but no amount of preparation, talk of preparation, I would say, um, helps a student who doesn't see the need for it. And so there's there's some effort and work on the faculty's part to get them to see the importance of not trying to go into something cold. Uh, if, if you've given them an opportunity and you've given them information for preparation, there might need to be something they bring with them to the experience so that there's an accountability to that. But yes, each level of learner, you're going to see a difference. And by the time they get into their last semester, you, you don't have to maybe do as much. You may not have as much of a, a heavy duty preparation, uh, but they're still learning new concepts. There's some emergency concepts that they're learning. So, you know, we go back to stating it's important to have them have seen the material and, and understand that disease process to some degree before you throw them into the deep end. Great, great answer. Thanks, Sammy. Um, so Danica, does this question come in? A couple of people have asked a, a similar question in the same form, and this de deals with next gen. Um, it's just how can I use pre-briefing to introduce students to NGN? Um, you know, and specifically about the nomenclature, about the terms um, to, to be able to introduce it there. Yeah, so I, I, um, I'm I still working on some of this myself, so I, it's not absolutely not a complete thing. You're, I'm sure you'll come up with more as you start doing a little bit, but like if you're using, um, I'm going to use the Montgomery College one, for example, so that is not an interactive sim, so if I'm using that for my students, and I know there's a shift report because I've done what we said and I've played through the sim. So I know there's a shift report that's provided. I might ask my students to do something like um, choose the, I'm looking at it here, choose the pertinent findings from that and, and choose the top four things because not everything that's included there is a relative finding. So I might ask them to list that because I know in the next gen that that one might be one of the formats they use when they give you a shift report. You might have to highlight it or put it in order, you know, your top two followed by your next two. Um, I might also, if we go to Rhonda's example of the diabetic sim, if I have a diabetes sim and I know it's a hyperglycemic patient, there's the next gen um, type question that you have to put. Is it, is it a sign of, let's say, DKA versus HHS, or is it not a finding when you have those drops? Or, or if it fits in both categories, I might have them write that out, or I might prepare um, a Google form or something like that with that type of test question on it also as we go through it. Um, some of this depends on how you're deploying these sims. Are they playing it independent at home? And then you're coming in for a face-to-face -face debriefing on it that you might just 
walk through it like that in a question format? Are they doing it together in the classroom like Rhonda said, that everybody plays together in a team and you have that pre-built? So any of the type of test questions that you're seeing in XGen, I think it's fair game to have them use in their actual simulation. Um, and again, this goes back to, to telling them ahead of time, um, these are what you need to watch for. This is what we're gonna be discussing. I hope, I hope that helped answer that question. So any of the ways they're set up there, I think SIM is, is aligned with being able to do that also. That's great. Answer. And, and I, I just just to tag tag on to that, uh, because sometimes the the simulation experience and, and we can talk about the varieties of those different types of experiences, whether we said it's virtual, or, you know, and they're doing it on their own. What what medications might you make sure that they understand? And, um, you know, the, the those details can at least have them have looked up you know, the, the uh, certain types of medications that might be associated with this, uh, you know, do, do they even understand that, you know, do you use D10, do, you know, all, all of those uh, uh, pieces, we want them to come with some confidence of, of a foundation. Uh, so as they step in, they still may be making choices and decisions from that novice level. But if they have some resources with them, that they've done a little preparation, some little activities that you've kind of assigned them that get them to a place where at least they have something in their pocket mm -hmm. uh, to pull out and, and to say, oh, you know, I looked that up yesterday. You suggested, it, you know, they're talking to each other. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a group dynamic that can, can, can really work uh, them together through the experience. Yeah, watching for watching for those cues, just using any of the, the newer nomenclature you're seeing in that clinical judgment, medical, uh, clinical judgment. Oh, I forget what the M stands for. Um, measurement model. Thank you, measurement. I was like, medical model, that's not right. <laughs> well, and, and I... I know when I first went to my first meeting where we were talking about the uh, clinical judgment measurement model, I was confused. And it was, I had to practice using uh, the vocabulary and incorporating it in everything that I did to help make it more sense to me. And then, it, so I think the same with the students, it's just repetitive. Repetition of using the same words, you know, gets them into, I think provides that comfort. That's a great answer. Thank you. Um, and just, just start using it with each one. You know, what cues did you recognize? Have, you know, write this down or bring it forward or fill out your sheet for when you do come, you know, maybe there's a worksheet that you've given them with the, with some of the Sims. If they don't have the um, interactive portion or even in addition to the interactive ones, maybe they're not covering everything you'd like to cover. And it's, it's interesting. I wanted to point out from your discussion earlier, Sammy, um, a really good reason to make sure you play through all of this is I've had discussions with students who noticed something about the sim that wasn't even in there and has had really neat, robust discussions. And had I not watched it all the way through, you know, not doing fast forward or jumping to the questions, thinking I know it all, I'll miss some things that they want to discuss. So that's really important. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, we did have someone that was asking about references. So I am going to put, we do have a, a slide that includes some references. Um, and I also want to make sure that people are aware of the resource, the OADN VSR website uh, that's out there. And I'll make sure that I, I include it on a follow-up email from this webinar. Um, but you know, the, the OADN VSR um, provides some reviews of clinic virtual simulation products um, that are available. Uh, and it's updated and new products are added all the time. Um, so, you know, take a look and, and keep a lookout for, uh, for that follow-up. Uh, but here are some of the references that Sammy and Rhonda and Danica used um, for this presentation. Um, so I hope everyone finds that, finds that helpful. Um, our time is up. Um, so I really want to thank um, our presenters. Um, and hopefully everyone got 
something out of today. I think there was a lot of great points um, and, the, and the discussion was fantastic. And I hope you had a lot of fun with the video um, because I, I thought it was entertaining and I thought there was a lot of great, great information in there. Um, this is part one of a three-part video series. Um, so part two will be coming up on October 5th um, and that will deal with debriefing. Um, so um, you know, we'll have some different presenters uh, in that one. And this really is a preview of a workshop that's happening at the OADN conference. Um, the OADN conference is happening in November. Um, so keep an eye out for, um, or, or look up on the website on when that conference is. Um, and this is gonna be a part of a larger workshop that deals with integrating NGN into um, all of your simulation activities. Um, so, you know, check that out. And we hope we get to see uh, as many of you in New Orleans um, as possible. Um, and again, in the follow-up email, take a look. I'll include the link to register for part two um, of this three-part series. Um, also want to thank our student actors. Um, so uh, Sarah, Courtney, and Amber, um, they really did a great job at the beginning of the video. So definitely want to, to thank them for their participation. Um, I know everyone's busy. Thank you for spending the time with us today. And I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Thank you.